Well, good to see people back again. You're gluttons for punishment, if I may say so. In the previous lecture, we explored forms of messianism which presented the messianic process as something that happened fundamentally in the mundane world, as a series of actions and events on the stage of history, and that produced as their outcome the kingdom of God in the form of an ideal state marked by justice, peace, and prosperity. But this is not the only way in which the messianic idea can be expressed. In this lecture, we will explore messianic scenarios where the primary locus of the action is in the unseen spiritual world, hidden away from human eyes. The work that the Messiah or other agents of redemption do is spiritual work, because the condition they have to address is fundamentally spiritual, not political. The question will always arise as to whether this work in the spiritual realm is seen as an alternative or a supplement to work in the mundane political world. In principle, it does not have to be a case of either or, and there are messianic scenarios where the Messiah manifestly operates in both spheres. Cosmologies which posit a parallelism between heaven and earth encourage the view that redemptive activity occurs in both. For example, the idea that each nation on earth has its angelic representative in heaven, the princes of kingdoms, <coughs> as they are known in the Hechalot literature, carries the corollary that relations between nations on earth are reflected in the relations between their princes in heaven and vice versa. So action in one realm will inevitably have an effect in the other. We find this idea already in the book of Daniel where Michael, the angelic prince of Israel, fights against the angelic princes of Persia and Greece and intervenes at the eschaton directly in events on the terrestrial plane. Here Michael is a major agent of redemption, a messiah if you will, and the prototype of all later redeemers from beyond this world who enter history and function there. He reappears, I would suggest, as the eschatological angelic redeemer Melchizedek, an 11Q Melchizedek from Qumran. This pattern of the descending redeemer was, of course, taken up in a big way in Christianity, but it also became typical of Gnosticism, though the work which the Gnostic redeemer descends to do is not political, but spiritual namely to awaken humanity from the sleep of ignorance and impart redeeming knowledge. Alternative to a descending Messiah is an ascending Messiah. That is to say the Messiah is human and lives on the terrestrial plane, but his redemptive work involves ascent into heaven stroke the spiritual realm. And important aspects of it are done there. It is this model which will primarily concern us here. The question will arise in all the concrete cases we examine as to whether the spiritual activity of the Messiah is supplemental or preparatory to him playing the expected earthly role of the Messiah in fighting and defeating the human enemies of Israel in battle. At the very least, in texts we will examine, this traditional mundane role is massively de-emphasized. At most, terrestrial events intrude only as noises off stage. It might still be urged that we are expected to factor in this well-known messianic role. But once again, I would suggest that we should resist the urge to harmonize and take the text strictly at face value. If they do not mention certain expected earthly activities of the Messiah, then these can hardly be all that important to them. Once we posit the heaven-earth parallelism, then three theoretical possibilities arise. One, the main action takes place on the earthly stage with maybe some secondary action in heaven. Two, significant action takes place on both stages though there will still be a powerful tendency to prioritize one locus over the other. Three, 
The main action takes place in heaven, the spiritual world, with possibly some subsidiary action on the earthly plane. The third model is the one I want to explore in the present lecture. This model, where a human messiah performs his messianic work mainly if not exclusively out of sight in the spiritual realm, poses acute problems of analysis. It is found mainly in the Jewish mystical tradition, and Sholem, post positing a sharp dichotomy between mysticism and messianism, was inclined to deny that it qualified as messianism at all. In his important monograph, Messianic Mystics, Moshe Idel argued strongly, and I believe correctly, against Sholem that it does qualify. But I have problems with Idel's analysis as well. His definition of Messianism is too loose for my liking. He is primarily concerned with mystical experience and its relationship to the growth of Messianic consciousness. And he talks of mystics who are their own messiahs and redeem themselves. Now that, to my mind, is a contradiction in terms. We must keep a cool head here and not lose sight of the deep structure of the messianic idea. A messiah has to be someone who redeems others, not just himself. His actions have to save the people of Israel, or humanity, or men the world. But what Edel has shrewdly noticed is the paradox that often the redemptive activities attributed to the Messiah in the mystical tradition seem to be activities which can be, and indeed are, performed by other mystics as well. And the question then arises as to why this one individual <coughs> should be singled out as the Messiah. Why not have simply a multiplicity of agents of redemption in which each mystic saves himself and the result in the end is a collective redemption? One way of solving this conundrum would be to see the Messiah as fundamentally a supreme spiritual guide who by example and teaching shows others how to redeem themselves. He becomes a special agent of this his redemptive, if his redemptive teaching is such that only he or a few others like him could impart. This would fit the pattern of the Gnostic Redeemer, though not necessarily with its element of descent. In other cases, however, it is implied the Messiah is a great soul. That is to say, although he is human, he is a very special or unique human who can do spiritual work which others cannot do. His spiritual exercises are, are more potent than those of the rest of us, and he uses his unique spiritual powers on our behalf. This view is often implied in the case of actual mystical messiahs that have arisen in Jewish history, but it is usually under-theorized. As Edel shrewdly remarks, in these cases the personality and charisma of the messiah often overwhelm his message, and the theology needed to support and justify his status remains understated. So much for general observations, now let us get down to some texts. Now I'll give you one of the texts here. Um, it's got both the Hebrew and an English translation. It's not the, some of them begin with the Hebrew and go on to the English, and some begin with the English and go on to the Hebrew. Um, the translation is my own. Those of you who can read the Hebrew, if you get bored, um, you can puzzle it out. The, the text I've given in the Hebrew there is not the recent edition by Rivka Ulmer, which is uh, what's called the Synoptic Edition. It's the old edition by Friedman, Ishalom, uh, in the 19th century, who actually tried to work out what the text was supposed to be saying. The manuscript tradition is very corrupt. It's a very difficult text, this, from a textual point of view. I've only given you one of the three texts I will be talking about. Um, it would have taken a lot of Amazon rainforest to give you the rest of the, the other three uh, Pisca odd. So it's just a sample of uh, the kind of text that we're looking at here. So first, I want to consider three homilies 
Piscas 34, 36 and 37. I've given you 34. From the late collection of festal homilies known as Pesicta Rabati. These expound a remarkable doctrine of the Messiah which has particularly attracted the attention of Christian scholars because it contains striking parallels to Christian ideas about the person and work of Christ. Some would argue that these Jewish homilies must have been influenced by Christianity, but Michael Fishbein, one of the few Jewish scholars to have recently given them much thought, argues that one should not assume that Judaism was so theologically impoverished after 70 that it could not have developed on its own the sophisticated meta-messianic doctrine expressed here. I am inclined to agree with him and would add that this conclusion is strengthened in my mind by the fact that the precise doctrine advocated by our homilists is unlikely to have been common among Christians they were likely to have met. So this question, who were the Christians they were supposed to be getting this from? In the homilies, the Messiah takes upon himself the punishment due to humankind, and his merit is transferred to them to atone for their sins. Those who know their Christian theology will immediately recognize here a variant of the penal substitutionary model of the atoning work of Christ. Now that is certainly a well-known Christian view, but although there are some foreshadowings of it, it seems to have been articulated in anything resembling the form we find it here in the Jewish homilies, only in the Cordes Homo of Anselm in the Latin West in the 11th century, long after our homilies were composed and far away from their place of origin. And it seems to have become widespread in the church only after the Reformation. Certainly, if our homilists were in contact with Christians, then given their time and place, they were much more likely to have met a Christus Victor understanding of the person and work of Christ, in which Christ defeats the devil and rescues humanity from his power. However, though direct Christian influence on the homilies is unlikely, it is entertaining, it's, it is entertaining, it's also enlightening, to put them into dialogue with the more developed Anselmian doctrine because in this way, some of their obscurities can be clarified and gaps in their argument discovered. For example, from an Anselmian perspective, the Pasikta Rabati doctrine of the person of the Messiah is seriously underdeveloped, in that no convincing explanation is given as to how the Messiah, though human, can himself escape sin and so atone for the sins of the rest of humanity. Though the three homilies are not identical theologically, and may not be by the same author, they emanate from the same circles, throw light in each other, and offer such a distinctive view that they can, I would suggest, be treated together. They did, um, from probably the 7th century, from Eretz Israel, so we're well before Anselm, and we're in the you know, we're, we're at the other end of the, the world. Um, what then is the Messianic doctrine of Piscus 34, 36, and 37 of the Sikta Rabati? <clears throat> the Messiah pre-existed the creation of the world. Quote, The Holy One contemplated the Messiah and his works before the world was created, and then under his throne of glory, Put away his Messiah until the time of the generation in which he will appear. That's from Pisca 36, not the one you have in front of you. The idea that the name of the Messiah pre existed the creation of the world is found in other texts and seems to make the point that before ever humans sinned, God in his forethought and wisdom provided the agent of their redemption. Our homilies offer a dramatic elaboration of this idea. But his pre-existence does not make the Messiah a superhuman being or an angel. He is human. And he is specifically contrasted with the angels. Behind this lies an anthropology which holds that all human souls exist before they come into the world. 
and are stored like the Messiah beneath the throne of glory. God, foreseeing that those souls would sin, was unwilling to bring them into the world unless the Messiah undertook in advance to atone for their sins through vicarious suffering. There are souls, God says to the Messiah, that have been put away with you under my throne, and it is their sins that will bend you down under a yoke of iron and make you like a calf whose eyes grow dim with suffering and will choke your spirit as with a yoke. Because of the sins of those souls, your tongue shall cleave to the roof of your mouth. Are you willing to endure such things? The Messiah will ask the Holy One, will my suffering last many years? The Holy One will reply, upon my life and the life of my head, it is a period of seven years that I have decreed for you. But if your soul is sad at the prospect of suffering, I shall, at this moment, banish these sinful souls. The Messiah will say, Master of the universe, with joy in my soul and gladness in my heart, I take this suffering upon myself, provided that not one of person in Israel perish, that not only those who are alive are saved in my days, but also those who are dead, that not only those who are alive be saved, saved in, sorry, um, that not only those who are alive be saved in my days, but also those who are dead, who died from the days of Adam up to the time of the redemption. And that not, not only these be saved in my days, but also those who died as abortions. And that not only these be saved in my days, but also those you thought to create, but were not created. Such are the things I desire, and for these I am ready to take upon myself whatever you decree. Now the universalism here is absolutely breathtaking. It is modified by more particularistic emphases elsewhere in the Piscus, but it's important to note that there is a theological logic to this universalism. Only such a promise by the Messiah that he will take a, make atonement for the sin of humanity can arguably justify God's creation of the world. It seems to be on the basis of this declaration that God silences the angels when they attempt to dissuade him from creating humanity because humanity will sin. The existence of the world stands on the promise of the Messiah's universal atonement. God's response to the Messiah's declaration is to elevate him and seat him on a throne like his own throne, borne by four living creatures, Hayot. In the Christian scheme of redemption, the exaltation of the suffering Messiah comes after he has successfully completed his earthly work. Here it seems to happen before he does it. In God's eyes, it is a fait accompli, on the basis of which he can go ahead and create the world, knowing that although things will go wrong, the means are already in place for them ultimately to put, be put right and for his purposes to be achieved. The exalted Messiah is here, I think, being depicted as the representative of redeemed humanity, as embodying the state to which they will ultimately come. I cannot read this without thinking of the elevation of Enoch and his transformation into the archangel Metatron in the third book of Enoch. But this exalted heavenly status brings the Messiah into conflict with the angels. The motif of the rivalry between humanity and the angels is common in rabbinic literature and is given a particular spin here. I already mentioned the opposition of the angels to the creation of humanity. This is actually <coughs> stated in terms of oppositions of the princes of kingdoms, the heavenly counterparts of the nations of the world, to the Messiah and his generation. They are called the Messiah's enemies. What we have here is a revival of the old motif found, as I noted earlier in the book of Daniel, that the conflict between Israel and the nations at the end of time will be murdered by a conflict in the upper world, which will involve the angelic representatives of those nations. In Daniel, however, the representative of Israel is Michael. Here the Messiah seems to take Michael's place, and the action is transferred from the end of time to before time began. 
The theme comes up again a little earlier in Pisgah 36. Satan observes God putting away the soul of the Messiah beneath the throne of glory, and he asks, Master of the universe, for whom is the light which is put under your throne of glory? God replies, For him who will turn you back and put you to utter shame. Satan said, Master of the universe, show him to me. God replied, Come and see. And when he saw him, Satan was shaken, and he fell upon his face and said, Surely this is the Messiah who will cause me and all my counterparts in heaven, the princes of the earth's nations, to be swallowed up in Gehinnom. As it is said, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Isaiah 25. The use of the title Satan here is noteworthy. Satan, of course, occurs in Tanakh as the heavenly accuser, but he is found very infrequently by name in Tanakh. Uh, sorry, in rabbinic literature. Instead, he's called in rabbinic literature Samael, and he is sometimes depicted as the angelic prince of Rome, Israel's main eschatological foe. In this Pisgah, he appears to head up the angelic princes of kingdoms who stand for a negative demonic realm opposed to God's creation, what in later Kabbalah would be called the Sitra Achra, the other side. It is through the sufferings of the Messiah that God will overcome these negative forces and achieve his purposes in creation. So far, all the action takes place in heaven. Indeed, before the world has been created. But the Messiah's work is finally to be done in the world. But that work is suffering. It is by definition passive. Here is no mighty warrior leading the armies of Israel to defeat their foes. For a period of seven years, the Messiah will undergo his redemptive suffering, unrecognized by the world, unrecognized by Israel, unrecognized even by those who look for his coming. Nothing visible is happening. But in the unseen world, a mighty spiritual work, a life and death drama is unfolding. The Messiah will be sustained by his God, who will tell him of his own sufferings at the destruction of the temple. The Messiah will say, Master of the universe, how can my strength endure? How much can my spirit take? How much can my limbs suffer? Am I not flesh and blood? God will reply, long ago, ever since the six days of creation, you took, upon this, you took this ordeal upon yourself. At this moment, your pain is like my pain. Ever since the day that wicked Nebuchadnezzar came up and destroyed my house and burned my temple and banished my children among the nations of the world, and this I swear by your life and the life of my own head, I have not been able to sit upon my throne. And if you do not believe me, see, the night dew has fallen on my head. As it is said, my head is filled with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. In the Song of Songs, of course, the beloved, the dod in the Song of Songs says this, and the dod is identified with God in Jewish mystical readings of the song. At these words, the Messiah will reply, Now I am reconciled. The servant is content to be as his master. This doctrine of the sympathetic pathos of God for the destruction of the temple is deeply important to our homilists. The doctrine itself is found elsewhere in rabbinic literature, most spectacularly in Pro M24 of Lamentations Rabbah. Our homilists belong to a shadowy group who called themselves after Isaiah 63, 1, mourners for Zion, Avelei Zion. They seem to have lived a life of penitence and self-denial in mourning for the destruction of the temple. They were not a rabbinic movement, and indeed the rabbis expressed concern about their extreme asceticism. They refer to the rabbis in a faintly ironic tone in Pisgah 34, the one I've given you, as the righteous, who spend all their time in the study of Torah. Torah study and even Torah observance are all very well, but they will not in themselves bring the Messiah. 
That will be achieved only through penitence, penitence that moves God, who is himself in mourning, to send his Messiah to undergo redemptive suffering. The mourners for Zion explain that they too are suffering the neglect and derision of their people, and those sufferings they see as being for the sake of the redemption. But they look forward to their vindication when the Messiah comes. And that's largely what Pisca 34 is about, the vindication of the uh, Avelation, as against the, uh, the righteous that Sadi came, i.e. The, the, the rabbi. It is perfectly clear that our homilists regard the sufferings of the Messiah as vicarious. They are advocating some sort of doctrine of penal substitution. This is made clear by their application, contrary to standard Jewish exegesis, of Isaiah 53 to the Messiah. Towards the end of Pisgah 34, we read, Vindicated and saving is he, Sadiq Vanoshahu, from Zechariah 9.9. This is the Messiah who vindicated God's judgment in Israel when they laughed at him while he sat in prison. Hence, he is called vindicated. But why is he called saving, if not because having vindicated the judgment on their behalf, he said to them, though all of you are sons of destruction, nevertheless you will be saved, every one of you, by the mercy of the Holy One, blessed be he. Afflicted, and he is riding upon an ass. This is the Messiah. And why is he called afflicted? Because he was afflicted during all those years in prison, while transgressors in Israel laughed at him. Laughed at him. The echoes of Isaiah 53 here are unmistakable. The Messiah is the suffering servant who was despised and afflicted but remained silent, who was taken from detention and judgment, yet he bore it all for the people's sake. There is another significant allusion to Isaiah 53 a little earlier in the same homily. When the righteous at the end of days confess their sins, come to their senses, they do so in the words of Isaiah 53, 6. Master of the universe, we have not right, acted rightly all these years. Like sheep, we have gone astray. Katson Ta'inu, which of course is a quotation from Isaiah 53. And the Holy One, blessed be he, will say, you are forgiven. Isaiah 53, 6, of course, ends, and the Lord visited upon him, the suffering Messiah, the iniquity of us all. A fact which the reader is surely meant to recall, because it suggests the basis on which God can absolve the people of their sins. The homilists appeal to a doctrine of attributed merit to explain how the Messiah's sufferings can atone for wow. the sins of the people. The homilist appeals to. Here, the Anselmian parallels are perhaps at their strongest. This comes out at the end of Pisgah 44, why does scripture say he is riding upon an ass? Because the wicked have no merit of their own, but he who goes, goes, and recalls the merit of the fathers. But through the merit of the Messiah, the Holy One, blessed be he, shields them and guides them in a straight way and redeems them. As it is said, they shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will guide them to rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. From Jeremiah 31.9. Now, the doctrine of attributed merit was well known in rabbinic sources. But it was associated with the merit of the patriarchs, and particularly with the Akedah, the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. This doctrine at once provides a mechanism by which the virtue of the Messiah can be transferred to sinners, but at the same time it creates a problem. Why can't the merit of the fathers atone for Israel's sins? The homilists attack this, attack this question head on. Note the contrast here, in the, what we just quoted, between the merit of the fathers and the merit of the Messiah. The clear implication is that while the merit of the fathers may reduce or postpone punishment, only the merit of the Messiah can fully redeem. And to put the relationship beyond any doubt, the homilist of Pisgah 37 
has the patriarchs say the following. Ephraim, our true Messiah, even though we are your forebears, you are greater than we because you suffered for the iniquities of our children and terrible ordeals befell you. Such ordeals as did not befall earlier generations or later ones. For the sake of Israel you became a laughing stock and a derision among the nations of the earth, and you sat in darkness and thick darkness, and your eyes saw no light, and your skin cleaved to your bones, and your body was as dry as a piece of wood. And your eyes grew dim from fasting, and your strength dried up like a potsherd. All these afflictions on account of the iniquities of our children, all these because of your desire to have our children benefit by that goodness which the Holy One blessed be, see, be he will bestow in abundance upon Israel. Yet perhaps because of the anguish which you suffered on their account, for your enemies put you in prison, you were displeased with them? The Messiah will reply, O patriarchs, all that I have done, I have done only for your sake and for the sake of your children, for your glory and the glory of their children, that they may benefit from the goodness which the Holy One, blessed be he, will bestow in abundance upon them, upon Israel. The patriarchs will say to him, Ephraim, our true Messiah, be content with what you have done, for you have made content the mind of your maker and our minds also. That couldn't be clearer. This is substitutionary atonement. And what this is very clearly saying is, okay, there's merits of the fathers, there's a quota of and that's good. But it's not enough to redeem, it's only the suffering of the Messiah that creates enough merit to redeem Israel. After the seven years of suffering incognito on earth, the Messiah will have to reveal himself. And now the action moves into the public visible stage. We are back in familiar territory. The seven years will be not only years of suffering for the Messiah, they will be seven years of divine tribulation for the world, the birth pangs of the Messiah. The scenario of the end takes on now a distinctly premillennial color. This is not surprising. It is hard to see how the homilist theology of redemption could work with a post-millennial schema. Now, post-millennialism works in Christianity, by the way, because of the double coming of the Messiah, but it is much more difficult to make it work on a single coming. But while events associated with the standard historical scenario are mentioned, they are treated in a rather perfunctory fashion, almost as a nod in the direction of the tradition. The really important action has taken place in the spiritual realm, and the public events are merely its outward manifestation. Pisca 34 ends with a rather cryptic reference to the days of the Messiah and the world to come. It looks as if, like Sadia, our homilist held to a doctrine of a double consummation. The ultimate state that humanity will enjoy is that of souls exalted in heaven like their Messiah, ranked above the angels. That's a quite extraordinary group of texts, that. And what one makes of them is very, very um, debated. Uh, but they say what they say, and I think the exposition I've presented is a reasonable exposition. For the remainder of this lecture, I want to consider now two actual messiahs who appear to exemplify my category of spiritual redeemer, but in rather different ways. They are figures who proclaimed themselves as Messiah, though the second in a guarded, cagey sort of way, were taken by numerous followers as Messiah, but yet they did little to engage in the kinds of activity that would be expected of the Messiah if they had conformed precisely to the messianic role outlined in the Amidan related texts. Their redemptive activity, such as it was, was spiritual, but this did not stop them being seen as messiahs. <coughs> the first of our messiahs is Shabtai Tzvi. His tragic story has often been told. Born in Izmir in Turkey in 1626, Shabtai was a strange and intense young man who immersed himself in Talmud and Kabbalah. 
and received revelations which he confided to a small circle of devoted followers. It was at the age of 22, so Sabatian tradition has it, that he first became conscious of his messianic calling. In the early 1650s, his bizarre behavior provoked in his, the Izmir rabbinate to put him under ban and expel him from the town. For the next decade or so, he wandered round, causing scandal wherever he went, to Salonika, on to Constantinople, then back to Izmir, on to Jerusalem in 1662, and from there to Cairo. In 1665, he made a pilgrimage to Gaza to pay his respects to a holy man there called Avraham Natan ben Elisha Haim Ashkenazi, Nathan of Gaza. Nathan proclaimed him Messiah, appointed himself the Messiah's prophet, and devoted the rest of his life to the Messiah's cause with astonish astonishing success. From Gaza, Shabtai went on his travels again to Jerusalem, Safed, Aleppo, but now he began to be mobbed by enthusiastic crowds hailing him as the Messiah of the God of Jacob. In 1665 he returned yet again to his hometown of Izmir, and in December of that year he and a band of his followers appeared before the doors of the Portuguese synagogue, which had been locked against them. Calling for an axe, he smashed his way in and terrorized the congregation, forcing them to pronounce the most sacred name of God and to recognize them, him as Messiah. He then went to Constantinople to depose the Sultan, <laughs> Mehmed IV, and to rule in his stead. He was thrown into jail. The way the way the Sultan Mehmed IV treated the uh, Shabtai was amazingly tolerantly. This guy arrives to take over your throne, and uh, the, the Mehmed seemed to have been largely amused by this, though every so often he got annoyed with him. So he throws uh, Shabtai into to jail, but even there, Shabtai manages to hold court, publishing messianic edicts and receiving delegations from all over the Jewish world. In September 1666, the Sultan, irritated by Shabtai's behavior, summoned him to Adrianople, Edirne, the old Ottoman capital where the court happened to be, and offered him a stark choice. Either be put to death or convert to Islam. Shabtai chose conversion and took as his Muslim name Mehmed, the name of the Sultan. No longer confined to jail, but under sort of house arrest, Shabtai lived for a while in Adrianople, continuing to hold court just as before, till in 1673 the Sultan, in utter exasperation, banished him to a remote town on the coast of the Adriatic, where he died in 1676. This is a very famous story. Sholem wrote a magnificent book on Shabtai's veganistical desire. What form of messianic idea does Shabtai Tzvi exemplify? Here it is important to distinguish between one, the kind of messiah Shabtai himself thought he was, two, the kind of messiah his immediate followers thought him to be, and three, the kind of messiah those across the Jewish world who believed in him thought he was. These three images do not necessarily coincide. Glugel of Hameln, in her famous memoirs of the time, tells of how her father-in-law, caught up in the initial messianic fervor that swept the Jewish world, packed his bags and awaited the Messiah's call to return to the Holy Land. Clearly he expected an ingathering of the exiles and was probably following in his mind something like the Amidah's eschatological script. For three years, it's rather touching this, for three years after he lost faith in Shabtai, Glugel poignantly tells us, he hadn't the heart to unpack his bags. <laughs> so painful was his disappointment. Sholem argued that the extraordinary acceptance of Shabtai's claims was due to the fact that Lurianic Kabbalah 
had been widely disseminated in the Jewish world by the 1650s. And that was the main reason why so many people were prepared to recognize a Lurianic style redeemer. That suggests that a single worldview embraced all the actors, the Messiah himself, his inner circle, notably Nathan, and the wider following. But the prevalence of Lurianic Kabbalah has been questioned by more recent scholarship. And even if it was widespread, it seems unlikely that it would have been deeply absorbed by ordinary folk. It would have remained surely an elitist worldview. Many people doubtless saw the Messiah in their own terms. He was a symbol on which they inscribed their own hopes and fears. They did not stop to ask what the Messiah himself thought he was doing. There are plenty of sociological and historical reasons why Sabbatianism may have spread as and when it did, without invoking a shared worldview other than the basic messianic idea that God would one day send the Messiah to redeem Israel. There is evidence that Nathan, Shabtai's prophet and publicist, toyed with popular messianic ideas and tried to exploit them to advance the cause while at the same time giving little weight to them himself. Nathan himself, who was a deeply read Kabbalist, seems to have seen Shabtai in a Lurianic perspective. For example, he explained Shabtai's strange apostasy in terms of the Lurianic myth of the breaking of the vessels. Luria had taught that there was a first failed attempt by God to create the world. God's first act of creation was to contract, to withdraw into himself, in order to leave a space in which beings other than himself could exist. But when the primordial light shone out into this void, it proved too strong for the vessels which had been formed to contain it. It shattered them, and the light fell as sparks into the depths of the cosmos. These divine sparks remained trapped in the negativity of matter, and Shabtai, Nathan argued, by converting to Islam was entering the realm of impurity to release the sparks. It was a brave attempt to explain perhaps the most paradoxical of all Shabtai's many paradoxical acts. And Nathan may well have believed, him, believed it himself. It certainly suggests that for Nathan, the redemption which the Messiah was to bring was more than the re-establishment of an independent state of Israel, but the mending of the cosmos. And that could only be achieved by activity in the unseen spiritual world. But there is no good reason to think that Shabtai himself understood his conversion to Islam in this light, or entered into it in a cool and calculating way. Getting at Shabtai's own messianic consciousness and thinking is extraordinarily difficult. His bizarre behavior and his huge mood swings invite psychological explanation, and many have argued that he presents the pathology of severe bipolar disorder, and that might caution us against looking for too consistent and rational a worldview. It's, he himself has left little behind in the way of written texts that set out the script that he thought he was following. But he must have been following some sort of script in his own head, even if it was being written and rewritten as he went along. Moshe Edel has argued that the sources of Shabtai's own messianic thinking lie not so much in the Lurianic Kabbalah, but in pre-Lurianism, and specifically in the Zohar and the writings of Avraham Abu Lafia, medieval um, Kabbalists, excerpts from which are well represented in the Sefer Pliya, which circulated in Turkey and which Shabtai probably studied closely in his youth. He saw himself as an Abu Lafian type of messiah. That is to say, he was called upon to engage in spiritual exercises of various kinds, which would bring redemption. But that redemption was first and foremost a redemption which would take place in the spiritual world. Fundamental to all forms of Kabbalah, whether Zoharic, Abulafian, or Lurianic, 
was the belief that sin had affected not just the human world, but the divine as well. There is a profound parallelism and synergy between the upper and lower worlds. What happens in the one has repercussions in the other. Human sin has caused disharmony with the world within the world of the Sephirot, the manifest Godhead. The divine itself has been deeply disturbed, and there can be no redemption till unity and harmony has been restored in the upper world. Indeed, while in theory on this scenario <coughs> redemption is also to take place in the lower world, the sacred marriage that will reunite the upper and lower spherot, and thus unify the Godhead again, will be matched by Israel's return from exile to the Holy Land. So there's a be percussions on air. In practice, the focus is almost exclusively on the upper world. The implication is that there lies the key to the redemption. Getting things right, get things right there, and the rest will automatically and miraculously follow. There is little suggestion that when spiritual redeemers whose work lies in the spiritual realm have finished there, they are then expected to leap onto a charger and lead the peoples of Israel into battle. Events on earth are treated in these schemas in a perfunctory manner, if at all. Shabtai clearly did expect some consequences in the lower world. That is suggested by his going to Istanbul to receive the kingdom from the Sultan, and his appointment of members of his immediate family as rulers over parts of the world. He just distributed large chunks of the world to his brother, his brother-in-law, and so on, appointed them king of this and king of that. Shabtai clearly did expect some consequences in the lower world. Uh, but in general, there's a profound inwardness to his messianic consciousness. The outward manifestations of his activity appear only as paradox, as strange acts in terms of this world. They make sense only if we evoke, invoke a hidden esoteric world. It seems probable that that <laughs> Shabtai saw his role as being one that involved engaging in spiritual exercises, what are known in Kabbalah as Yehudim, unifications, that would bring about redemption on high. These revolved, involved, among other things, pronouncing the explicit name, Shem HaMeforash, or engaging in symbolic acts, like his marriage to Sarah, his third wife, which enacted and sympathetically promoted the heavenly sacred marriage. But this raises acutely the problem I mentioned earlier. Many Kabbalists of all schools engaged in these Yehudim. What was it about Shabtai that he could be seen as a special or unique agent of redemption? In my analysis of the Messianic homilies in Pesikta Rabati, I pointed out that, theologically speaking, one of the weaknesses of their position is that it did not explain how a Messiah, who was a man like other men, could have atoned for the sins of the rest of humanity. Christology shows that, in the case of spiritual redeemers, the person of the Messiah is important, and Pesikta Rabati simply fails to develop this side of the doctrine. The issue seems, however, to have been addressed in Sabatianism. Shabtai was presented as a great soul whose spiritual origins lie unusually high, perhaps uniquely, up, high up in the Sephirotic world, the world of the Godhead, and specifically in the Sphira known as Bina, knowledge. Moshe Edel has set out persuasively the evidence for this. By implication then, Shabtai was able to do things that others could not do. Edel has suggested that the young Shabtai's awakening messianic consciousness may have been affected by the fact that in the Sefer Pliya, the Sphira of Bina is astrologically linked to Saturn, Shabtai in Hebrew, and that his depression was to some degree a pose that dramatized the link between Saturn and melancholia. 
Shabtai's redemptive acts and the Abu, Abu Lafian tradition are all about the exercise of raw, theurgical, even magical power. There is no moral dimension to them whatsoever. And that power derived from the exalted origin of his soul in the sphere of Bina. It is very hard to tell from Shabtai's own writing, life and writings, what form he believed the redeemed condition would ultimately take. He was a failed messiah and did not live apparently to complete his work. But I find the appearance of, uh, in his thinking of a concept of apotheosis, of divination, deeply suggestive. This takes the form of a variant of the Metatron tradition, Metatron in the sense of exalted Enoch, a human who was caught up to heaven and transformed physically and spiritually into the highest of the archangels. And according to three Enoch, installed as a second god, the lesser name. Intriguingly, you have seen a form of this tradition come up outside the mystical tradition in Basikta Rabati. The idea that Enoch Metatron is the forerunner of all mystics, the psychopomp, who points the way to their ultimate blessed condition is very strong in the mystical tradition. It parallels the idea of theosis or apotheosis in Christian mysticism. Does Shabtai Metatron perform a similar redemptive role as the forerunner of the beatific vision? This ultimate state of redemption for the individual would, of course, be consonant with the doctrine of the world to come. There is a tendency for spiritual messianisms to correlate strongly with the doctrine of the world to come. But the effect of this is often, if not totally, to bypass the days of the Messiah or at least to downplay them as a somewhat awkward detour into history and materiality of a process that essentially belongs to the spiritual realm. I have called Shabtai a failed messiah and that is how he is viewed in the Jewish world. And because he failed, he must be false, for the true messiah by definition simply cannot fail. However, Shabtai illustrates a point about spiritual messiahs which should not be missed, and it is that it's actually difficult for them to fail. A political messiah, if he does not defeat the enemies of Israel and bring in an independent Jewish state, publicly and spectacularly fails. He is discredited, though hardcore followers may still invoke a doctrine of occultation and look for him to return against all the odds to renew the fight and to triumph. A bit like King Arthur and his sleeping knights who will emerge from some hillside somewhere to save England in the hour of her greatest need. But because the spiritual Messiah operates in the unseen world, his failure is harder to verify. There is greater scope for sheer faith. This point is illustrated by the greatest of the spiritual Messiahs to arise within Judaism, Jesus of Nazareth. But it is illustrated by Shabtai Tzvi as well. When he converted to Islam, many of his followers fell away, but many remained. When he died, the same thing happened. And throughout the 18th century, there were Jews of undoubted intelligence and learning who continued to believe in him, though from fear of rabbinic censure, they kept their faith to themselves. Indeed, the last of Shabtai's followers, the Dönme of Turkey, who followed their master into a public profession of Islam, only died out, so rumor has it, in the late 20th century. So there were Shabbateans in Turkey, this strange Islamic sect called the Dönme, um, right down to the late 20th People keep saying they're still there, they're still there, and one, it's very hard to verify this. So that's Shabtai Tzvi. Before I conclude this lecture, I would like to say something about the messianism of the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. And I must begin with a very emphatic Lahavdil. Although the messianic fervor that broke out in Lubav Lubavitch Hasidism from the late 1980s onwards is unquestionably the greatest manifestation of Jewish messianism since the Sabbatian movement of the 17th century, 
we are dealing with a very different phenomenon and a very different messianic personality. Shabtai, by any standards, was a deeply troubling, sinister figure who had a powerful antinomian streak to his theology. The Rebbe, by way of contrast, has been widely hailed outside the circle of his followers, both by Jews and non-Jews alike, as a man of spiritual wisdom and leadership, a kind of Jewish answer to the Dalai Lama. And he had no truck with antinomianism. His whole philosophy was bent towards the fulfillment of the mitzvot, as traditionally understood. There is also another difference. Whereas Shabtai has left few of his own writings behind him, and indeed the impression one gets from what he has left is that he was no intellectual and possibly not even all that intelligent. The Rebbe has left behind a mass of sermons and talks running to something like 200 volumes. Everything he said in public has been noted down and published potentially for all to read, in keeping with the openness of Chabad. And in my view, he is a thinker of, he was a thinker of stature. But therein lies the problem. The material is vast and composed in Yiddish and Hasidic Hebrew in a highly technical Chabad style that makes no concessions to outsiders. Some material has been translated into English, but it seems sometimes to be sanitized for external consumption and should probably not be relied upon for strictly academic purposes. So you've got to go back to these Yiddish and uh, Hebrew, Hasidic Hebrew, Sikhot and, and uh, Mamarim, um, and they are tough. Uh, I gather even for Chabadniks they're tough. So there's almost too much material, huge difference from um, Shabtite speed. The Rebbe's Messianism is conflict, complex, and I can venture only a few notes on it here. Anything like a full treatment would require a lecture series in itself. And I must freely confess I am not entirely sure I've got it right. Given his background, one would expect him to be a spiritual redeemer, much of the Sabbatian type. But while he is depicted as performing mighty spiritual works in the spiritual realm, Yehudim, that is not where the emphasis in his messianism seems to lie. His messianic doctrine appears to represent a highly original reconciliation of the political and spiritual forms of messianism, achieved by appealing to a basic Chabad doctrine which sees the presence of God in everything and in every place, and which transcends the dichotomy between matter and spirit by seeking to elevate the material and make it a means for the manifestation of the spiritual. Fundamental to Chabad theology is the idea that the material world and its life are not beyond redemption. They can share in the redemption and for this reason cannot be seen as evil. On this basis, the Rebbe and his followers are able to hold a rather traditional scenario of the end in gathering of the exiles, the rebuilding of the temple, the war of Gog, the wars of Gog and Magog. But while taking these more or less literally to give them a powerful spiritual meaning. It is highly significant that he takes as the starting point for his vision of the end, not some abstruse and rarefied doctrine derived from the Kabbalah, but the view put forward by Maimonides in Yad Melachim one of the most down-to-earth, minimalist, political, end-time scenarios that you can find in the whole of Jewish Messianic literature. The Rebbe himself was deeply engaged with the everyday world and strongly encouraged his follower to be engaged as well. And he intervened from time to time in politics in both Israel and the States. <coughs> this was part and parcel of his deeply Messianic theology. It was all working towards the taking up of everyday life into the divine, which was the ultimate goal of redemption. <coughs> Did he regard himself as the Messiah? The issue was hotly debated both among Chabadniks and outsiders. A few points could be made with some confidence. First, there is no doubt that he himself whipped up 
messianic expectation among his followers almost to fever pitch. He declared that there was no conditions left to be met before the Messiah come, so he could come now. And indeed, on several occasions, he told his startled followers that the Messiah was already here. Second, there is no doubt that groups of his followers regarded him as Messiah and urged him to declare himself as such. At first, he rejected the title with some severity, but later he seemed to soften and tacitly to accept it. What we have here is probably, we cannot know, but probably, the mysterious process of the dawning of a messianic consciousness. At what point and why does someone become convinced that he has been called to be Messiah? The Rebbe would not have been the first Messiah to be unsure of his calling or to be reluctant to reveal his call even to his closest followers. It is possible he did increasingly believe that he was the Messiah. Not the actual Messiah, but the potential Messiah. Now this is a distinction that is introduced by Maimonides in Yad Melachim. The Rebbe may have believed he had graduated to the point, so to speak, where it, he had become a serious contender, a serious candidate for Messiahship. But only time would tell if his candidacy would blossom into full-blown office and he would become the actual Messiah, Hamashiach Bevadai. In, um, my, in Maimonides' phrases. <laughs> Finally, whether or not he was the Messiah, he saw himself and his followers as having a definite role to play in ushering in the kingdom. But the role was a spiritual one to be exercised in the everyday world, namely the spread of spiritual values among Jews and among humanity at large, the raising of people's consciousness. Maimonides had described one of the Messiah's tasks as being to battle in the wars of the Lord. Maimonides was for sure referring to actual wars that the Messiah would wage in the fields of battle with the enemy of Israel, enemies of Israel. But the Rebbe exploited the ambiguity of his language to reinterpret these as spiritual battles which the Messiah would lead, battles against spiritual ignorance to spread the knowledge of God. And he undoubtedly saw his emissaries, his shlichim, whom he sent to the four corners of the world, as his soldiers who were already engaged in that struggle. He was the spiritual commander-in-chief, the great teacher and guide. And in fact, he's called commander-in-chief quite often, was called commander-in-chief quite often by his uh, followers. At the back of his mind was probably a famous vision which the Besh, one of the founding fathers of Hasidism had, and which he reported in a letter to his brother-in-law. The Besh tells of how he made an ascent to heaven and entered the chamber of the Messiah. He asked the Messiah, when will the master come? The Messiah replied, by this you shall know, when your teachings will become public and revealed in the world, and your wellsprings burst forth to the farthest extremes, that which I have taught you and that which you have comprehended. And they also shall be able to perform unifications and elevations like you. Then all the shells will cease to exist and there will be a time of goodwill and salvation. The shells are the clipot, the fragments, the shards of the vessels in Lurianic Kabbalah, which broke under the impact of this outshining of the divine light. So it's, it's alluding there to the Lurianic doctrine of the sparks. So there's a spiritual, very powerful spiritual dimension in this. In other words, the spread of the spiritual message of Chabad will bring in the kingdom. There is an intense activism here that is characteristic of post-millennialism. Typically, the Rebbe's Messianism also involves an interesting blend of both particularism and universalism. Following Chabad philosophy, he defined the Jewish people in a metaphysical way as having one soul, 
distinct from the rest of humanity. But at the same time, he did not exclude non-Jews from the kingdom. Parallel to his campaign for mitzvah observance among Jews, he promoted a campaign to encourage Gentiles to accept and observe the seven commandments to the sons of Noah, and saw this as equally important in bringing in the redemption. There is then a long tradition of messianism within Judaism which can loosely be called mystical or spiritual. It differs from political historical messianism fundamentally on the question of where it places the primary locus of redemptive action. For historical messianism, the primary theater of action is history. The redemptive acts are visible historical events. For spiritual messianism, the primary theater of action is the unseen spiritual world. It is very tempting to explain the latter type of messianism as a development of the former, the mystical of the historical. In other words, political messianism is the default position. Certainly it is hard not to see the spiritual tradition as from time to time turning elements of the political scenario into symbols and reinterpreting them in a blatantly metaphorical and <coughs> spiritual way. This might point to the priority of the political scenario and reinforce somewhat Scholem's claim that this represents normative messianism within Judaism. That may well be how, on the whole, things diachronically evolved. But we should, not be, we should be careful not to oversimplify. There is a strong case to be made that the prototype of the spiritual messiah lies in the ideology of kingship that we find in the ancient Near East aspects of which are reflected in the royal psalms. The Messiah is a king, but how we define his role will be affected by the ideology of kingship we embrace. The king was widely seen in the ancient Near East as a mythical, magical figure who functioned as a mediator between heaven and earth. He operated in the unseen spiritual world, and if he did his job there properly, then the rains would fall and the crops would grow. To be sure, there's no hint of this magical role in the law of the king in Deuteronomy. The king there is depicted as someone who upholds the law. The view of the king, this view of the king as a purely political figure, was strengthened among Jews in the Hellenistic period by Greek ideas as the, of the king as the empsuchos nomos, the incarnate law, if you like. This is evident from Jewish on kingship literature, such as the letter of Aristeas or Philo's Moses, or Josephus's depictions of David and Solomon as ideals of kingship in his Antiquities of the Jews. But the older magical oriental concept of kingship did not go away. In Judaism, it found a home in the apocalyptic tradition, which uniformly insisted that you cannot divorce events on earth at the end of time from events in heaven. Spiritual messianism, therefore, has very old and very deep roots within the Jewish tradition. So old, in fact, that I would question that we could ever postulate a primitive stage in the development of messianism within Judaism when the only manifestation of the messianic idea was political. Tomorrow, in the final lecture, I will, look, look, I will take post-millennial forms of Jewish mess messianism, both modern reform and classic Tanaitic Amoraic uh, manifestations, present my comprehensive taxonomy of Jewish messianism and conclude with some observations on the possible implications of my analysis for Jewish Christian dialogue. Thank you.